Good morning and assalamu alaikum guys. Uh, today I'm Dr. Asif. Today we will discuss about carcinoma stomach. And uh, now you all you know that uh, it's a very large chapter. It's a very important topic. And uh, I'm sure each and every one of you will get a question or more than one question in your final prof exam, right? in the written, in the viva, or maybe you will get a long case. So this is very, very important. And it will not only end in your final prof, if you are going for FCPS or MS or any other degrees, FRCS, MRCS, everywhere carcinoma stomach would be a very, very important topic. Now, uh, it's a very large topic quite difficult to finish in one uh, hour, but uh, I will try to touch the more important parts. And if you guys want a, a more detailed session, then maybe uh, another day we can discuss it in more details. Okay, so uh, I will discuss it uh, as if we are having a long case and how we are going to write a long case, because I think that's more important. And there are a lot of lectures in the on the online, you can just have a look at those, those are theoretical lectures. We will also touch a little bit of the theory as well today. So let's start. Okay, so we start with the particulars of the patient. Now then the particulars of the patient, as you know, it's uh, cancer, so um, usually, Patients who are more than 40 years or about 450 years, they are more prone to these cancers. Nowadays, certainly younger patients are getting these cancers as well. Like all solid malignancies, male are more prone to carcinoma stomach. Chief complaints. Now, uh, the complaints of, uh, of the problems in case of cancer, can be uh, written in different ways uh, with some subheadings. Uh, now these are not, you will not get these things in your book, but this is how I write it. For example, in case of carcinoma stomach, the patient goes to a stage when the patient is asymptomatic. That's the early asymptomatic stage. When the patient will have no problems, but the patient already has a small malignancy in the stomach without any symptoms. This is the time if you could uh, do a screening endoscopy, then you might be able to find the cancer. It actually, this is actually the best time to treat this patient. If you could treat this patient at this time, somehow the patient was lucky enough to be diagnosed with a case of carcinoma stomach, then it would be very helpful for the patient. This is what happens in the Japan, in, in Japan where uh, the cancer patients or cancer customer strong patients is very high in numbers. So they do a screening endoscopy. And uh, if they can find it in the early stages, uh, sometimes curative resection can be done. Then comes the early symptomatic when the patient uh, gives features like abdominal pain, discomfort, dyspepsia, excessive gas formation, maybe loss of appetite, and, and features like that. Then comes the advanced stage, when you, might, you may find a lump in the abdomen, uh, maybe features of uh, uh, obstructive features may be present as well. Then comes the emergency features, when there's excessive bleeding, there may even be perforations, or there may be acute intestinal obstruction as well. Metastatic features, for example, the carcinoma stomach metastasizes into the lung and the patient uh, may give features of, uh, let's say, hemoptysis. So that's metastatic features. And what are non-metastatic features? For example, migratory thrombophlebitis, as you all know, is one of the features of carcinoma stomach. That is one of the non-metastatic features. So what are the uh, complaints or what are the chief complaints we usually see from a carcinoma of stomach patient. Commonly, they give history of pain, upper abdominal pain. Then there may be loss of appetite. These, these are rarely patient comes with this. Uh, in, the, in the government medicals, you may get 
uh, more advanced cases like abdominal lump or the obstructive features or bleeding in the form of hematemesis or maybe in the form of melanoma and weight loss. Why weight loss happens? Number one, because there's severe uh, loss of appetite or anorexia, number one, and different uh, cytokines which are produced by cancer cells, which are called cachectins. This causes significant weight loss. Now, in case of a cancer in a patient with serious stomach, what are the in case of cheap uh, carcinoma stomach, we have just discussed about the chief complaints. How would you write the history of present illness or presenting complaints? Now, you can definitely write it in your own words and I would certainly prefer that. Uh, this is how I usually write it. Uh, this definitely depends on the history and the complaints given by the patient. So let's see what happens. According to the statement of the patient, he was reasonably well about five months back. So usually there is a short history. Then he felt pain in the upper abdomen, which was gradual in onset, burning or dull aching in nature, moderate in intensity, non-radiating, lasting for a few hours, aggravated after taking food, relieved by antigastric medications with no periodicity. This is quite important. Now, if you see the complaints, these are usually features which are uh, also common with peptic ulcer disease. And when the patient gets, takes antigastric medications, the pain or the discomfort is relieved. So what happens, the patient, this actually delays uh, his diagnosis. Patient comes, uh, patient tries uh, to relieve his symptoms with antigastric medications for a few months and when he fails, then he comes. And usually there's no periodicity. You, if you remember, peptic ulcer disease has periodicity. What do you mean by periodicity? That means the symptoms are apparent for a few weeks. And after that, for a few months, the patient is asymptomatic. Again, the symptoms becomes apparent. So this is called periodicity. Now in case of carcinoma stomach, there's usually no periodicity. Okay, let's go on. For the last, two months, he has been suffering from vomiting, which is projectile in nature. So projectile vomiting is a very specific feature for gastric outlet obstruction. Now remember, rare, you will get, rarely you will get this sort of feature in case of carcinoma stomach, but this is more common with peptic ulcer disease, chronic peptic ulcer disease with gastric, gastric outlet obstruction containing undigested food materials of previous meal, which is sour in taste because of the acid, non-bile stain because the obstruction is above the duodenum, but occasionally blood stain. Why blood stain? Because most cancers are ulceroproliferative lesions and all ulcers bleed. He also has significant unintentional weight loss. This is very, very important. Significant. Why we say significant? That is around about 10 kgs in the last three months. Why is it unintentional? Because patient has had no intention. Patient was not dieting or taking any other medications to keep his weight down. But still the patient is losing his weight. Now, the one uh, explanation for this weight loss is the loss of appetite to all types of food. He feels tired all the time. Maybe the patient has anemia and unable to continue his daily activities. His bladder habit is normal, but complains of occasional passage of blackish stool. Features similar to Melina. He also has, he has no symptoms like jaundice, headache, cough, hemoptysis, and bone pain. Now, the, from the features, previous features, you may think that this is a case of carcinoma stomach. So you take history of metastasis. Okay, so past history and medication. The patient, usually some of the patient has a long history of peptic ulcer disease, uh, but why is it different? Because for previously, his symptoms usually lasted for one to two months, but for the last five months, his symptoms are not subsiding, rather they're getting worse. 
you don't have to write all this in past history, but you can if this history is present. This is usually a very, very significant history or something different is happening this time. History of pernicious anemia, atopic gastritis, you don't have to take it, but you should remember these are precancerous symptoms. Previous gastric resection, this is also very important because the areas around the anastomosis are prone to gastric malignancy. And general history should take history of hospitalization, surgeries, medication, long-term illness. Medications, very important, and allergic history. Personal history. Now, if you look at Japan, you will see that uh, most of the uh, Japanese people, they take salted food. They take food which is salted and smoked food. They usually give preservatives with it as well. So what happens if you take this type of uh, uh, food, which is salted or smoked food for a long time, then there's always a chance that you may have stomach malignancies because these are, these are carcinogens. Nowadays, the, they, they, they are more food grade and I think there's less chance of those problems. But if you keep on taking these things for a long time, there's still chances of malignancy. Now in Bangladesh, we don't to take this. So there might be some other environmental factors like formalin and the other things that we take with our food. Smoking and alcohol. These are, as usual, always the greatest carcinogens. Family history. Family history, like all malignancies, family history is always very important. Should take the history of any familial malignancies uh, the patient is having. Most importantly, father, mother, and sister, brother. Socioeconomic status. Certainly, carcinoma stomach can happen to all uh, uh, people of all socioeconomic status. But if you look at the stomach, What happens is the distal cancers in the distal stomach happens to more commonly poor or lower socioeconomic status people. And upper socioeconomic status has malignancies in the upper part of the stomach. So this is written in the Bailey and Love. So I have told you this, but uh, I it's uh, there is no real justification for this. But this thing can happen. Uh, because what they see is that in the third world country, uh, the distal stomach is more uh, involved due to kind of cancer. And food habit, poor food preparation, because if you use preservatives, those, those always have a chance of turning the cells into precancerous cells. Immunization history is important. Uh, history, general examination. Now, as you know, the patient is probably anemic. The patient has lost a lot of weight, so the appearance would be ill-looking. Body build may be average. Nutritional status. Body mass index would be low. Patient will be anemic. Very commonly, almost all the cancer, carcinoma stomach patients that I have seen were anemic. Why they're anemic? Because they, they lose a lot of blood through the cancer, because most cancers are ulceroproliferative lesions. Ulcero ulceroproliferative lesions. These are ulceroproliferative lesions and any ulcer, from any ulcer there may be bleeding. And also carcinoma stomach is one of the causes of unexplained anemia. Carcinoma stomach and carcinoma cecum are two of the uh, ga gastrointestinal tract cancers which causes unexplained anemia because the bleeding is usually not visible. The patient is not symptomatic, there's no visible bleeding or if you do the basic investigations, you will not get any cause of the bleeding. You have to go for endoscopy or colonoscopy to find out whether the patient has CS stomach or CA colon.
So these are the causes of anemia. Jaundice, why jaundice may be present? Because there may be liver metastasis or more commonly, the lymph nodes around uh, the hilar lymph nodes. If you look at the liver, something like this, and this is the stomach, right? So what happens? There are a lot of lymph nodes in and around the external biliary channels. And when these lymph nodes uh, are enlarged, if there's metastatic lymphatic deposits due to carcinoma stamma, then these lymph nodes compresses on the external biliary channel. This area is the porta hepatis, right? So the lymph nodes in and around the porta hepatis, if they are they large, they compress on the external biliary channel and they may also cause jaundice. Why there may be edema? Usually this is nutritional edema because the patient cannot take food. There is lack of albumin or protein in the body and which causes edema. Cervical lymph node enlargement, usually left supraclavicular lymph node enlargement, which is called the varcose gland or the tortuous sign. Dehydration, the patient is vomiting, may cause dehydration. There sometimes may be pigmentations, I'll show you. This is left supraclavicular lymph nodes of the varcose lymph node, and the sign is called tortuous sign. How this thing happens? If you see the stomach, for example, the stomach is here, let's say. So lymphatic drainage ultimately reaches the thoracic duct. Through the thoracic duct, it reaches this area. And the left supraclavicular lymph nodes are in this area. So when there's metastasis in any intraabdominal organ, in the case of advanced disease, the left supraclavicular lymph nodes may be enlarged. Acanthiosis nigricans, these are the non-metastatic features. Acanthiosis nigricans and tortuous syndrome or migra migratory thrombophlebitis. Why this thing happens? Because of pro-inflammatory, sorry, pro-thrombotic cytokines released by the cancer cells. This also happens in pancreatic cancer. So in case of local examination, local means abdominal examination. Usually most of the patients have weight loss and they have scaphoid abdomen. There may be abdominal distension as well in case of ascites, if there is obstruction, but always you should remember in case of upper abdominal obstruction, there is not usually generalized abdominal distension. Usually distension is limited in the upper abdomen. There may be visible abdominal lump or abdominal peristalsis if there is features of obstruction. Sister Joseph nodule, if there is metastatic deposits in and around the umbilicus. So when you palpate, what are the things you palpate? Whether there's any tenderness, if there's a lump, you want to check the site size, most importantly, fixity. This is very, very important if it's fixed or not. Also the size of the lump. Now, one thing you should remember, whenever there is a palpable abdominal lump, and if you think this is a malignancy, this is always an advanced disease. This is always an advanced disease, usually irresectable. may be resectable, but usually irresectable. May be incurable. Usually, even if it is resectable, No, I think it'll be the 
receptacle. Uh, if this is even if it's ear, if it is receptacle, it is usually incurable. That means the cancer cells have already uh, spread to different other organs as well. Because whenever you get a lump which is palpable, that means the cancer has been there within the body for a long time, and chances are great that it is already spread to other parts of the body. There may be lymphatic spread, there may be peritoneal metastasis. So usually they're irresectable, even if it is resectable, usually an incurable disease. We palpate the liver, whether there's a fluid fill for ascites, a subcussion splash, whether there's any obstructive features. Kruckenberg's tumor. This is usually when there's pelvic deposits or there is over and in the Female, in case of female patients, there may be ovarian deposits. This is also a sign of advanced cancer. This is not palpable, by the way. This is not palpable. Percussion, if there's shifting dullness, if there's ascites. Oscultal percussion, it's not necessary, but some examiners may want you to show them whether you can perform it. It's a very simple procedure. Tell your uh, teachers to teach you about this. Very, very simple procedure. And parrectal examination, there is rectal shelf of Blomer present. This is a sign of peritoneal metastasis. So salient features. Now, in case of salient features, we talk about the important positive and negative finding. Now remember, don't talk, uh, don't make the salient features very long. It should be very short. Try to finish the salient features within uh, five sentences. That's the best thing to do. Make it short because as short because you should remember what how do we say the salient features? In a round, you give the important negative and positive findings to your consultant so that he can make a judgment about the patient. If you if you take more than five minutes, then it would be it would not be very effective. So make it as short as possible. For example, in case of carcinoma stomach, your salient feature may be something like this. Mr. X, 50 years, a farmer from Borishal was admitted with the complaints of dyspepsia, hematemesis, severe anorexia, and significant weight loss for three months. He has melina, but no metastatic features. He has been suffering from peptic ulcer disease for more than 20 years. <coughs> Excuse me. He is cachectic, severely anemic, and has palpable varcose gland. This is on general examination. He has a non-tender mass, the non-tender mass in the epigastric region, extending from the left hypochondriac region, measuring about 10 centimeter by eight, by eight centimeter, hard in consistency and fixed. So what's your provisional diagnosis? Your provisional diagnosis is carcinoma stomach, you can certainly add a few more adjectives like whether it is advanced. If it's a palpable lump, definitely this is advanced. If the patient has features of gastric outlet obstruction, you say it's a case of carcinoma stomach with gastric outlet obstruction. There may be different, uh, the differential diagnosis. Remember, they're according to your clinical findings. It may be peptic ulcer disease with gastric outlet obstruction, lymphoma of stomach, GIST, or gastrointestinal stromal tumor. Now, remember, with the features, don't say the patient has C A transverse colon. It can be a differential if there's an upper abdominal lump in the epigastric region, but with the features of dyspepsia and anorexia, don't go for C A transverse colon. Even the patient may be a case of advanced C A gallbladder. You don't have to write this, but remember that I have seen quite a number of patients with advanced CA gallbladder uh, who has been has features of who had initial features similar to carcinoma stomach. So uh, you should be judgmental. You should judge what your diagnosis, what your initial diagnosis should be, according to your clinical findings. Investigation now. What the first investigations are the ones you use to confirm your diagnosis or to exclude your differentials. So the most important diagnosis with the features that this patient has is endoscopy and biopsy. 
for example, if the patient has an ulcer, something like this, you should divide it into four parts and take two biopsies from each part and two from the center. So that means 10 biopsies from different parts of the body. But you should try to take the biopsy from as much as possible from the periphery as well. Because this contains the most representative tissues. You remember in case of ulcers on the body, we do a wedge biopsy, right? So these biopsies are similar to that. You should try to take the biopsies from the periphery of the lesions as well. Then comes staging. Once you have diagnosed that this patient has a malignancy, you should stage the disease. Now in Bangladesh, we go for ultrasound, chest x-ray, liver function tests, and so on. But the most accepted investigation nowadays worldwide is CT scan of whole abdomen and chest. You may also go for endoscopic ultrasound if you, in case of uh, early gastric cancer, to check uh, how much it has penetrated into the stomach wall. Serologic markers, different serologic markers can be done. CA72 for, is the more um, specific for CS stomach. Then we go for the fitness of anesthesia and surgery. So this is a malignant ulcer, intestinal type. And this is an example of diffuse type. In case of diffuse type, there's usually no single lesion. So sometimes we miss the diagnosis. Pathological classifications, Lawrence classification. This is quite common. Lawrence classification, two types, this intestinal type and diffuse type. Why do you say intestinal type? Because they, for, they have gland formation similar to that of the intestine. In case of diffuse type, they're poorly differentiated. And the diff diffuse type happens more commonly in the younger patient. Intestinal type has more common hematogenous spread and diffuse type has more common transmural and lymphatic spread. Diffuse type is more familial and intestinal type is environmental, which happens from gastric atrophy and intestinal metaplasia. According to depth of invasion, we can differentiate or classify carcinoma stomach as early gastric cancer, and advanced gastric cancer. Now, early gastric cancer involves the mucosa and the submucosa with or without involvement of the lymph nodes. And advanced gastric cancer invades into or beyond the muscularis propria. For example, if this is mucosa, and then this is submucosa. And let's say this is, this is the muscle layer. And this is the serosa. So early gastric cancer will involve something like this. And advanced gastric cancer will involve the muscle layer or may also go beyond it. So Japanese classification of early gastric cancer. Remember the early gastric cancer myth, in, it has only invaded into the mucosa and submucosa. So there may be protruding type and there may be excavated type. And if they're flat, it may be of three types, superficial, elevated, superficial, depressed, and flat. Type one is protruding type. Type two is superficial, 
which may be into three categories, to three groups, superficial elevated, superficial flat, and superficial depressed. And type three is excavated type. Bowman's classification of advanced gastric cancer. Maybe the protruding type, ulcerative type, Answer infiltrative type and diffuse infiltrative type. This is the diffuse type of cancer, all called the linitis plastica. Called the linitis plastica. This is what you see when you do a barium meal. You'll give, see a Persistent filling defect, a persistent filling defect. This one is in the antrum and there is a gastric outlet obstruction. This is normal. This is a endoscopic ultrasound. You don't have to learn about this, but remember that there is an investigation for endoscopic ultrasound. This is more accurate staging can be done when it is uh, when the tumor is uh, confined within the stomach wall. So this is the TNM staging. T1 means it has invaded into the up to the submucosa. That is mucosa lamina propria, muscularis mucosa, and submucosa. This is all it has involved in into. Type two, the muscle layer, the muscularis propria has been involved. Type three, the subserosal connective tissue without invasion into the visceral peritoneum. And type four, type four means it has invaded into the serosa, and 4B means adjacent structures. Lymph nodes, N0 means no lymph node involvement. N1 means one to two regional lymph nodes. N2, three to six regional lymph nodes. Sorry. And N3 means more than seven lymph nodes. M1 means distant metastasis, M0 means no metastasis. So uh, these are um, the lymphatic tiles, the, the, the four lymphatic tears that is present in case of carcinoma stoma. The N1, the perigastric, N2, branches along the celiac axis, then the N3 and N4. Uh, this will not be asked in the examin examination, but uh, if you know this, you get some extra marks for that. But in case of uh, postgraduate examinees, they should know all of them. But at undergrad level, if you see that it's not very difficult, at least the N1 lymph nodes, the perigastric lymph nodes. What are the perigastric lymph nodes? Number one, this is the right cardiac. Number two, this is the left cardiac. Number three, these are the lymph nodes along the lesser curvature. Number four are the ones along the greater curvature. Number four S is short gastric lymph nodes. Four S, left gastroepicoic, and four D are right gastroepicoic lymph nodes. Five is suprapyloric and six intrapyloric or subpyloric lymph nodes. These are the N1 lymph nodes. But in case of uh, D1 resection, which I will come uh, in, the, in, in the future, uh, all the six lymph nodes plus the seventh lymph nodes, lymph nodes along the left gastric artery, these are also removed, this one, in case of D1 resection. So you, you should know that this uh, first seven lymph nodes, other lymph nodes you don't need to remember, 
But the first seven lymph nodes should be remembered. The examiner may ask you this question. Yeah, we have already discussed this spread of gastric cancer. There may be direct spread to adjacent organs like pancreas, colon, and liver. Lymphatic spread, Varco's node, which is called Troisius sign. Blood-borne metastasis, lungs, bones, liver, transperitoneal spread, anywhere in the peritoneal cavity. There may be ascites, Huckenberg's tumor when it involves the utero ovaries, and sister Joseph nodules when it involves the umbilicus. Now, as we have discussed that some of the investigations like CT scan, which we do, now look at what happens here. The, the cancer is in the posterior wall of the stomach. Here is a cancer. And you can see that there is no specific boundaries between the cancer and the pancreas. The fat plane between the pan cancer and the pancreas is not there. So that means there is involvement. So this is a very advanced cancer where the cancer has invaded into pancreas. This is almost impossible to resect. You can do some debulking in this case, but which is no, not going to be very helpful. Now there is a secondaries into the liver. Those are the secondaries, multiple secondaries in the liver. Then Secondary is in the lung. PET scan is another investigation which is quite expensive, but quite an effective investigation, which is done and a whole body scan is done to see, check for any distal metastasis. In this case, if you see, there is some hypermetabolic areas in and around the celiac trunk. That means some metastasis has happened in and around this, lymphatic metastasis has taken place in and around this area. This may be metastasis into the liver as well, but you have to check what type of metastasis this is. And lastly, another investigation which is always done, that is the staging laparoscopy, because peritoneal seedlings can only be found by staging laparoscopy. Peritoneal seedling can only be assessed by staging laparoscopy. No other investigation can diagnose this. So if there's a peritoneal seedling, that means it's an incurable malignancy. So after doing all these investigations, the confirmed diagnosis would be carcinoma stomach. At what site? Maybe the antrum, maybe the body with or without hepatic metastasis. So team, what is the treatment? Treatment number one, number one, the first thing you should talk about is it's a multidisciplinary team approach. That means there may be the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, the gastroenterologist, oncologist, the pathologist, the radiologist, multiple disciplinary team approach means multiple disciplines must be involved. They give their own assessment and finally, a decision is uh, a decision is made about what is the best treatment plan for the particular patient. For example, a surgeon may say, "Let's go for surgery," but the oncologist would say, "This is an advanced cancer. We would first like to go for chemotherapy, and when the cancer becomes smaller, then do the surgery." The pathologist and the radiologist may, may support those arguments. They may say, yes, this is an advanced cancer. This um, CT scan shows that. 
the pathologist mentioned is a poorly differentiated cancer. So let's go for the best treatment plan. The anesthesiologist would discuss mostly about the fitness of the patient, about the surgery. And the DHPDP gastrointestinal doctor would discuss how to do, uh, how to uh, medically treat the patient before and after the surgery. Now, always remember, in case of carcinoma stomach, surgery is the only curative treatment. It's the only curative treatment. If you want to cure the patient, it has to be done by, it has to be, has to undergo surgery. Why? Because even if it's an adva advanced disease, this is the best palliation and most accurate staging can be done with it. So surgery is the only curative treatment. Even in case of advanced disease, this is the best palliation and it also provides the most accurate staging. What is the goal of surgery? The goal of surgery is oncological clearance. What do you mean by oncological clearance? That means if this is the tumor and it has spread about five centimeter distally and five centimeter proximally, and it has also spread into the local lymph nodes. So what we do, we remove the cancer, make sure all the margins are taken, the proximal, the distal, the radial, all margins must be cleared with negative margins. That means at least five centimeter in the unstretched stomach together with the lymph nodes. This is called oncological clearance. Again, they must be in end block. That means they must be continuous. They, may not, they, will, they should not be piecemeal. That means that you cannot extract them separately. Then oncological clearance is not done. Oncological clearance means they has to be taken together or end block. What we remove end block, the whole tumor. All the margins, the proximal, distal, and radial margins should be negative with adequate lymphadenectomy. Negative margins of at least five centimeter. And since you have removed part of the stomach, there must be a reconstruction to maintain continuation of the gastrointestinal tract. So this is what we do in case of subtotal gastrectomy. The cancer is over here. The cancer is over here. So we remove at least five centimeter distal and five centimeter proximally together with the lymphatic resection and we do the reconstruction. How do we do the reconstruction? Uh, this may be slightly difficult for everybody to understand. For example, if you look at this, let's say this is the stomach. And here's the cancer. So you reset this part of the cancer. So let's say if this is the stomach and here's the cancer. So you remove part of the stomach. So this part of the stomach is removed, right? But now you have to maintain the continuity, right? So let's say this is the duodenum and this is the jejunum, let's say. So what we do is we cut it from here, the jejunum. Let's say this is part A and this is part B. So part B goes all 
all the way over here. So what happens over here? Part B goes all the way over here. So part B is attached over here. And part A is anastomosed with the distal portion of the part B over here. So this is called Ru and Y gastrojejunostomy. This is the gastrojejunostomy site, and this looks like a Y. Ru means root. The root looks like a Y. That's why we call it gastrojejunostomy. Ru and Y gastrojejunostomy. This reconstruction is called Ru and Y gastrojejunostomy. Now, in case of the other type of cancer, for example, let's say the cancer is in the body or in the upper part of the stomach. So we have to remove the whole stomach. The whole stomach is removed together with the lymph nodes. Oncological clearance is done. And let's say this is the duodenum and this is the jejunum. Then we re remove, let's say this is the part B and this is the part A. The part A goes all the way over here. So the part A goes all the way over here, and this is called the esophagojejunostomy. And distal part of the part A is anastomosed with part B. So this is radical total gastrectomy with RU and Y reconstruction. What happens here? This is the esophagojejunostomy. And this is the jejunojejunostomy, right? So this is with what is happening over here. This is subtotal gastrectomy. This is radical subtotal gastrectomy. And the same thing is happening over here. Ru and Y esophagojejunostomy. If no reconstruction can be done, then only gastrojejunostomy is done. Just a bypass is done in case of irresectable tumor. Extent of dissection. Remember, there are three type, three lymphatic tiers, and then one, the N2 and N3. So D1 means. D1 means only N1 lymph nodes are removed N block with the stomach. D2 means N1 and N2 lymph nodes are removed. And D3 means lymph, N3 lymph nodes are removed. What are some of the complications, post-operative complications, paralytic ileus, leakage. Yes, this thing can happen, leakage. From the site, this is not uncommon. This sometimes can happen. Leakage from the suture site, leakage from the duodenal stamp, which is quite common. Uh, nowadays, it happens quite less. I rarely, for the last uh, five years, I hadn't seen any duodenal stamp leakage, but it does happen at times. Stomal obstruction, most commonly due to stomal edema. 
Highly dumping syndrome. What do you mean by highly dumping syndrome? Because as because the stomach is not there, so what happens is the food from the esophagus goes directly into the intestine, right? So when it reaches the intestine, the food is vasoactive substances. So when it reaches the intestine, huge amount of fluid is taken from the intestine into the food bolus. And this causes sudden fall in blood pressure and dizziness of the patient. This is called early dumping syndrome. What is late dumping? When there is excessive food into the intestine before going to the stomach, and that causes hyperglycemia in the body, which causes excessive insulin. And this insulin causes reactive hypoglycemia. Hypo. And this reactive hypoglycemia causes the late dumping syndrome. Reactive hypoglycemia. Bilious vomiting, this uh, sometimes can happen. Gastric stump cancer, this is a long-term complication. Vitamin B12 deficiency, why? Because the distal part of the stomach produces intrinsic factor of castle and uh, vitamin B12 must um, attach itself with the interesting intrinsic factor of castle to be absorbed by the distal ileum, right? So if the stomach is not there, the intrinsic factor of castle cannot be secreted. As a result, there's vitamin B12 deficiency. So what happens is the patient must take vitamin B12 supplementation, right? In what form? In IV form, because orally it cannot be absorbed. Osteoporosis can also occur. Calcium absorption is lacking, which may cause osteoporosis. Chemotherapy and radiotherapy are other forms of treatment, which are not necessarily necessary for undergrad level. Radiotherapy usually is not effective. So chemotherapy has some effects. What happens is in case of advanced cancer, when or irreceptible cancer, we give chemotherapy. In case of irreceptible cancer, which are very large or invaded into the surrounding organs, uh, when we give chemotherapy, the tumor becomes smaller and becomes more resectable. And after that, we do the surgery. So this is most of the things that we have to learn about carcinoma stomach. Uh, I would certainly suggest that you go through your book. Bailey and Love is very good. Um, there's a lot more, most of the information is there. If you want to know a little more about carcinoma stomach, uh, the Cushieri book is very, very good. Um, they are, most of the information or some of the information which I have taken is from the Cushieri. You should go through that book. If you have uh, some time, uh, I think you would like it because it's very simple. Uh, and it's a lot of information is there. And at least once at one time, if you go through it, the concept of carcinoma stomach will be very simple to you guys. And definitely you must go to Bailey and Love. And for all other purposes, Bailey and Love is the most important ones. Uh, but uh, Kushier is certainly going to help you. So thank you for your time. Um, so if you need uh, to know something more about this, we can discuss it. You can ask me the questions later. And uh, maybe in the far next classes, we will discuss more about carcinoma stoma. Thank you, guys. Uh,